Hello, and welcome to our first study live of 2023. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. I am joined today by senior scientist, Franck Marchese, and we're going to take a look at some of the exciting space science in the works this year. So thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to all of our viewers from around the world. Please let us know where you are watching from. All right, Franck, there's a lot to get to today. So let's get this show on the road. Thank you for joining me and being here today. Thank you, Beth. Happy New Year, first of all. Happy New Year. I wish you the best and uh, to everybody watching us as well. Fantastic. Did you have a did you have a good end of year? Was it a good time? Yeah. Restful? I took uh, 10 days off, which is pretty rare. And um, it was nice. I did some coding and I learned new, a new language and I... Uh, and I thought about new proposals, but I also spent some time in the snow with uh, the family. So it was. Nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. I went. I I took some time off, and I went to Arizona, spent some time with my family, and uh, that was really nice to sort of just. It was a very busy year, right? This was this was an extremely was. busy year, and and I, I am I'm kind of excited to say I think this next year is gonna be about as busy. So I'm um, already kind of kicking it off with a bang with some cool science coming out just this week. And then next week we have AAS. So, all right, let's, let's talk about what's coming up. Um, where should we start? Let's start with general astronomy news. What is happening in the, the realm of general astronomy in 2023 that we, we know about at the moment? Um, well, I can talk about a lot of things because uh, with a telescope, you can observe anything you want almost. But I'm going to focus on a few phenomena that are going to be visible with, for a large part of the population with naked eye. Um, eclipse is what comes to my mind first when I, when I think about astronomy. Um, so we're going to have a total solar eclipse um, in April 20, which is going to be... Uh, visible in Australia, northern part of Australia. Uh, we have a lunar eclipse on May 5th, observable from in Europe, Asia, Africa, Oceania. So almost half of the world will observe that. That's kind of cool. Um, we have another lunar eclipse on October 28, 29, observable as well from Europe, Asia, Africa, and uh, same part, more, more or less. What I really like is the annular solar ec eclipse we're going to have uh, in North America and South America. And this will be visible on October 14. So maybe we can explain the difference between a total and annular solar eclipse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a total, So this is what's kind of really cool about eclipses for me, is that it is a happenstance of geometry. So we can manage to get a total solar eclipse simply because of the apparent you know, diameter of the moon and the sun on our sky are the same. <laughs> so when we get these perfect alignments, uh, which, which happen pretty much every year, you get two a year, sometimes they're both total, sometimes they're not. It's, it can get messy because the, the moon's orbit is not completely in the plane of Earth. So it goes, it shifts up and down a little bit. So when you get a total one, it means it's just right in the perfect spot and from certain places on Earth, you get a total eclipse where the moon completely covers the sun. And those are a big deal. Scientists, astronomers love to go chasing them and, you know, go find the strangest, wildest places to go observe a, a total solar eclipse. Um, temperature drops, night, out, night animals become active. It really is kind of an incredible experience. I've only seen one. I was lucky enough to be living someplace where one went through. So that was pretty neat. Um, and, and I would love to go chase them. How about you? How many have you seen? What have you done? And then uh, explain the difference between a total and an annular. I've been I've seen three uh, solar eclipses. Um, once through the, through the clouds. That was in 2004, 2009, France. One annular in Japan, in, about in Tokyo. And one total eclipse in Oregon. That was uh, two years ago, three years ago. So... Annular eclipse is basically when the when the apparent diameter of the of the moon is slightly smaller than the apparent diameter of the sun, and this is due to the fact that our, the orbit of Earth around the sun is eccentric, 
eccentric, so I mean, not perfectly circular. So sometimes the sun is slightly bigger or smaller, and the same for the moon. Does, the moon doesn't have a perfectly circular eclipse around, uh, a perf perfectly circular orbit around the uh, around the around Earth. Oof, I need some coffee. So in this <laughs> case, you have the the um, the moon is slightly smaller, so you see the surrounding, the age of the sun. So you make kind of a disc, a ring, a ring. And it's beautiful. I love those. I've seen the, my first one was in Japan, as I mentioned, and that was a mystical moment for me. I've, it's a beautiful picture. It's not total, so it's not fully dark, like we have uh, with total eclipse, but you can take beautiful pictures. And this one is going to cross, as I mentioned, South America North, and North America, uh, several states. Uh, there is multiple maps. I don't have the map here with me. I can look maybe, but uh, if you are on the path or not too far away, on October 14, or if you want to have some to, some cool experience with friends, I recommend you take uh, you do a road trip to see uh, this annular uh, solar eclipse. That sounds pretty amazing. Um, so we've got we've got our, our pair of eclipses and, and a couple other little minor ones going on there. Um, I saw, and I'm kind of <sighs> cautiously optimistic. We have a comet that was discovered last year that could, 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 could um, become a pretty decent comet um, in February, late January, yeah. early February. So it is Comet 2022 E3 ZTF, which means it was discovered by the Zwicky Transient Facility. And um, it, it, it could be, it's going to hit its closest approach to Earth. February 1st, February 2nd, and that means that it could be, and I, I, again, I stress could, I don't trust comets anymore. Um, it could be visible with um, the naked eye. So that that's kind of exciting. And, and binoculars telescope, uh, so long as it doesn't get eaten up by the sun. Yep. So this comet is, uh, is about to do its perihelion, so meaning come very close to the sun now. And, and then later will come closer to us. So what is important here is that it's a comet that probably is doing the first passage in the inner part of the solar system. And 10% of those comets disintegrate or flare out during the shortly after the perihelion. So my recommendation is that you look at the news, you look for this, what's happening with this comet, if you have a telescope or binocular, try to observe it. It's going to be visible uh, uh, the beginning of the at the end of the night in January, and then slowly get observable toward the beginning of the night in February. Uh, we are going to observe it with Unistellar. In fact, we are doing it. Ariel Grykowski, one of our researchers at the SETI Institute, is in charge of monitoring this uh, this those comets, and she has collected like hundred observations from the network. And right now, we are basically measuring the intensity and it's gonna be very close to naked eyes uh comet me my intuit six if i remember the last diagram she showed me before the before christmas mm -hmm. so it means that in dark place you will be able to see it it's, gonna be it's, it's a it's an interesting comet because it's not coming in along our orbital plane either it's coming in from above yeah so it's actually coming down through the orbital plane so that's pretty neat as well so um you know obviously check out JPL's website. Um, they have a, a great way to go look and visualize some of these orbital paths. So you can kind of take a look at them and, and, and see that's going to be, that's going to be pretty amazing. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> well, we already, I already observed it with my Unistellar telescope. So Yay. It's, it's already beautiful right now. It's kind of greenish in the center of the coma and it's asymmetrical, which is kind of weird. I wanted to ask Ariel about that, but uh, I did not go yet to the office with her. So next week, we we'll probably have some news or a blog post about this comet, explaining to you about what we have found We have found with the Unistellar network. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to that. And we'll definitely get that shared out. I'm going to take a quick second to welcome people in. Um, let's see. We have viewers from the UK, uh, Italy, uh, Missouri, North Carolina, Japan, here in California, Brazil, New York, Mexico, Australia, Florida, Canada, uh, Georgia. Um, hello, Ron on the Bayou. Good to see you. Um, Utah, 
um, Texas, Bulgaria, welcome. Uh, more UK, lots of UK. Thank you everybody for watching. Uh, North and South Carolina. And let's see, I think uh, some more Canada. Uh, yeah, all right. So lots of viewers from um, uh, quite a, a large portion of the planet. So thank you everybody for being here. Frank and I are talking about um, what we can expect from space science next year, or this, this year, this year. Happy New Year. <laughs> I'm going to be miswriting dates for, you know, a couple months. Um, all right. So that's some general astronomy. Did you have any other interesting, nope. different? Okay. So it's also the standard meteor shower. So the Quadrantids peaked last night, but if you didn't have a chance to go out and look, just because it peaked doesn't mean it's not still going on. It is a smaller shower, so it doesn't have as big a window. So um, I would get out tonight if at all possible. But we'll have the, the other showers, the Geminids, the Perseids. The, they're all going to, you know, we've got them all coming this year. Maybe, so Maybe it's meteor showers all the time. I think. Meteor showers all the time. And Damn you can right. always check out the CAMS project if you want to know what um, we're discovering on, on a pretty much nightly basis these days. All right. Um, heading out off of the planet from what we're viewing here and what we're doing in space, mm -hmm. we have some pretty neat uh, missions coming up. I mean, we had some pretty cool ones this last year. We had DART. That was pretty amazing. Uh, we'll talk about space telescopes a little later, but we had JWST uh, start taking data. And so it's, again, it was a pretty impressive year what have we got coming this year in the realm of planetary missions that you're looking forward to well the big mission in my mind is the launch of the juice mission mm -hmm. juice is the jupiter icy moons explorer mission by isa mm -hmm. we'll be launch um, i think they set up the date april 5th because it's just before our birthday that's right but that uh from uh, kuru with an iron five from french guiana uh, so this is an important mission. This is like uh, the expensive billion dollar type mission with uh, 10 instruments and so many of them, I'm not going to list them. But the goal of the mission is to truly understand the nature of the Galilean moon, Europa Callisto Ganymede. They're avoiding Io, unfortunately, because it's the most interesting uh, satellite in the, in the Jovian system, but it's basically it also a very strong magnetic field so they don't want to damage the instrument. So we mm -hmm. are going to avoid Io and go ops, explore the other moon. And the goal is really to, um, to confirm the existence of uh, liquid water beneath their surface and getting some more information of the type of activity we have underneath the surface of those Galilean moon. If they are an ocean, the size of the ocean, can you see some changes comparing with the Galileo's data, for instance, and over time, perturbations, magnetic perturbation due to the presence of water. Is that salty water or not? All those questions will be fully answered with the juice mission. But mm -hmm. we have to be patient because the launch is in April 5th, but it will arrive in 2031, right? So it's a lot of time. It is. It's always a lot of time. And, and uh, astronomical science uh, runs on astronomical terms. So uh, it's a long game sometimes. Um, whew, yeah, I'm excited about that one. Um, even though uh, Juice is not uh, going to do anything with Io, much to my, my sadness, um, NASA Juno, which received its mission extension, uh, will be doing another flyby of Io uh, this year at the end of the year. So they just did one at the end of last year. They will do another one at the end of this year. And that's pretty exciting because we'll get some more imagery. So um, I'm looking forward to those. And hopefully soon we'll see, get to see the imagery from uh, last year's flyby. They've released one image and I believe they should be uploading the rest um, sometime in the next couple of weeks. So um, looking forward to that and uh, just kind of a, a promo here. I will have the mission director, Dr. Scott Bolton, on SETI Live next week to talk about those, uh, that Juno extension and those um, Galilean moon flybys that they're doing. So uh, don't forget to come back next week too. Uh, what else have we got in the way of um, planetary? I have, oh. uh, I like this, uh, this private mission, the Venus Life 
uh, find a problem. So right. This is a mission. The launch is expected to be in May of this mm -hmm. next uh, this year. Um, the goal is uh, it's a it's a mission to search for phosphine and any other potentially biosignature in the atmosphere of Venus. So that's super ambitious. You probably remember the the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, which is still unclear, to be honest. Um, but MIT uh, partnered with a private company, Electron, I forgot the name, but I think it's Electron, and they designed a, very quickly a small mission that will go to Venus, launch a small probe, and there will be a very, uh, very simple instrument, which is basically a UV, it will, it will shine UV light, and we take picture, they will be able to see if there is any organic molecules by fluorescence using this type of uh, UV light. So it's gonna mm -hmm. be uh, simple, fast, simple to confirm whether or not there is um, organic molecules in the atmosphere of, uh, of Venus, which is kind of exciting. Right, and, and the company they partnered with is Rocket Lab, who is launching uh, the mission on their Electron rocket. Uh, so that's actually kind of a really cool thing that they've been doing. And yes, this is a this is a commercial mission. So this is not a space agency uh, government designed project. This one is actually just a bunch of people went, let's do the thing and ponied up the money to do the thing. So I'm yeah. um, very excited. And to it's from New Zealand. So these people observe, uh, watching us from the Southern Hemisphere should be proud because that's a, yeah, it's a Southern Hemisphere project mission. I like mm -hmm. it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the OSIRIS-REx sample returning in September. And uh, last I heard at the end of the year, we're still on schedule for that. So um, for those of you who, who might not remember, and, and if you're a regular here, I'm sure you remember, uh, OSIRIS-REx went and did a, a boop of asteroid Bennu that turned out to be more of a, a punch of asteroid <laughs> Bennu because Bennu is a rubble pile asteroid and not as tightly held together as uh, they kind of expected. So um, their sample arm went in about half a meter. <laughs> yeah. But um, that sample, they had to work to get it closed because they gathered so much material. Um, that, But that sample is on its way back to Earth and should be landing here uh, on September 24th is the current date. And uh, from there, that mission has also received an extension and is going to study uh, the Apophis asteroid. And has actually, they figured out how to route it so that it will make a decent uh, close flyby of Apophis about the same time Apophis is making its closest flyby of Earth. So very excited for that one too and where that mission is going this year. So yay, more asteroid research. <laughs> Yeah, monastery research is always good, especially a, a sample like that would give, give us a lot of information and we'll be able to compare with the mission, the Japanese mission, which also returned sample last year. So we mm -hmm. have two kind of sample of two bodies that look kind of similar, but may have some slight differences. So we're going to learn a lot about asteroid by comparing those. Yeah, um, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, in the interplanetary missions, I mean, there is something that we cannot ignore. But we talked a lot about it last year, in 2022. I watched our video, so I'm going to say it again. 2023 will be the year of the moon, of the exploration of the moon by private companies, OK? But last year, we were, expect we were planning this, and all the mission got shifted, basically, to 2023. So I'm hoping that this, this is going to happen. So we have the arrival of, um, and of course, I forgot the name of the mission in April uh, launched by um, iSpace. It's a lander. Right. The, the M1 spacecraft. M1 spacecraft. So they will be, not IM1, the other one. The one has, already has been launched already, but is basically having a so, such a complex orbit that it will, it will land only in April. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it's the IM1? OK. It's the, it's, it's the iSpace M1, yeah. Yeah, iSpace. So. So this is a this has a lander as uh, as it's a lander, but there will be also a mini rover sent uh, built by the uh, Mirate Space Agency, mm -hmm. and there will be a lot of them. There is a launch in March by uh, other IM1, Eagle Cam, uh, Space Byte. There is also Peregrine Lunar Lander, which is going to be later on. Uh, and to it. 
Intuitive Machines is, Intuitive is talking about machine. launching in March. As well. Uh, um, there is multiple launch by Intuitive Machine. In fact, there is one in uh, Q Q2. But we will see. Oh, and there is also, uh, I like this one, Lunar 25 by Roscosmos. Mm. Roscosmos, the oh, Russian right. space agency is going back to the moon with Lunar 25. Mm -hmm. um, together with um, Chandrayaan 3 from ISRO as well. So there will be a lot of mission, hopefully, in 2023 to explore the moon, uh, different area uh, of the moon, different type of science will be done there. What I like here is that NASA is contracting those private companies to basically put instruments on board those lenders and, uh, and do some analysis. So we, we will have multiple instruments from NASA, but also private instruments from private companies that mm -hmm. want to kind of uh, study the, sur the composition of the moon surface, etc. So it's a new way of doing scientific research. And, and I like this idea that NASA is now not afraid of failing because they're investing $700 million in an instrument, uh, multiple instruments for different lenders, knowing clearly that only a few of them will land on the surface of the, of the moon. Not all of them will manage, of course, to do that. It's a difficult, space is still difficult, especially landing on the moon. Absolutely. And, and um, I'm really, I think it's really great that we have so many different countries and companies adding to the the lunar research um, catalog basically and and in different regions you know China has their lander their rover that that they're doing their research in different areas and they're they just had a press release I think the end of last year or the beginning or the or earlier this week that was basically talking about different rocks that the different types of minerals that they're finding and because they're exploring a different area than the Apollo astronauts explored then we have, we're now starting to get this, this much larger wealth of information. And so for different companies in different countries to be landing these on there, I think is, is going to do nothing but add to the, the wealth of research that, that we're allowed to have now. So it's, it's a great time to be a, a lunar scientist. Yep. Um, one other uh, interplanetary mission that we're all sort of crossing our fingers for that, that got delayed um, because of events on the other side of the world uh, is the mission to Psyche. So we've been, that one, that one got held up, but, but someone seems to have rescued it and it, it could, could launch in October of this year to go look at the Psyche asteroid in the asteroid belt, which is interesting because why Frank? Uh, because Psyche is a metallic asteroid and it's probably the heart of a very primitive asteroid that differ differentiated. So he has a high con high content in nickel and iron. So that will be the first time we're going to see one of these metallic world, and we'll be able to understand maybe where they come from. And there is a more like more than just where they come from. There is also the idea that those metallic world could be an, a, a resource for material in the future. So understanding the composition of asteroids and studying specifically one with iron and nickel. To detect other type of uh, heavy metal, for instance, could be in, of interest for humanity at large, not only for science. So let's let's keep our our fingers crossed that that one that one finally gets to launch. Yeah, um, a lot went into that one, and I'd like to see it actually get out there and get to do its thing. It'll be launched um, by Falconevi from Florida, so you should go there. Oh, I'd love to. I still haven't. I, it's been a long time since I've seen a launch. Um, it would be nice to go back and, and see one again. All right, let's do that. All right. October Road 10, trip. 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Road trip live from Florida. Um, okay. Uh, there. That's pretty much it on the, the interplanetary missions and lunar missions. Um, there's a little bit we can talk about for crewed missions kind of going on. Um, there's always there's always going to be, I mean, at least for the foreseeable future, there will be people going back and forth to the ISS. Um, hopefully, they'll get stuff sorted out with with the um, Soyuz, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, but one of the big things coming up is uh, as we continue to increase, sort of, this last year sort of really kicked off. I feel like the the space tourism industry really kind of kicked into higher gear at least. Um, and this year, 
Boeing Starliner may finally um, take a crew to the space station. Um, that's, I think, sort of the biggest one going on there. Um, are there any others that you know yeah. of? Well, uh, you know me, I like private industry, so I'm going to mention the, whatever is the Polar is Dawn mission, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, a, uh, a SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon with uh, four passengers. They will stay in orbit for five days and will be at 520 kilometer altitude. And one of the key parts here is that they are going to try to do the first commercial, commercial spacewalk. And they're basically going to wear their uh, outfit and uh, open the window <laughs> and go outside and come back. That's the way we did in the 70s. And they're going to repeat that. But this time is, it will be with a private crew and a private mission. It's a commercial mission. And then in the commercial realm, we also have the Axion Mission 2, uh, which will be launching a Crew Dragon. And this is a 10-day commercial flight of four people, one professional astronaut and three private astronauts to go to the International Space Station. So that's really the beginning, I will say, of the private mm -hmm. industry tourism. I mean, we've done that in the past with one as private astronaut with a surrounding by three or, two or five uh, professional astronauts. But here we are talking about a mission with essentially some private astronauts. So people who have not been, have been trained to be astronauts, but they're not like part of an agency. They just buy the ticket. Just, mm -hmm. I don't know how much they just buy the ticket, but they bought the ticket to go to the International Space Station with Axiom. And, and uh, it's not just private companies that are expanding their reach. Uh, national organizations are doing the same thing. Um, uh, ISRO's doing an uncrewed test of their, their new spacecraft that they plan on using for their own astronauts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exciting. And of course, China continues to build their space station and has, has <clears throat> I think has plans to add at least one more module, um, if not two. And, you know, they did a lot, pretty decent expansion of it this last year. So that's going to continue. So we're, we're also seeing other countries uh, continuing to um, add their voice to that side of, of the space race as well. And it's not really a space race anymore, but the, the yeah, space industry... Nice. <laughs> the space industry. I mean, it's we should stop this space race because it's not a race anymore. Everybody's is there. It's Everybody's there, industry, and it's development of a new industry in space. Yes, that's what we're doing. It's happening, and uh, and I'm pretty sure that our kids will be the commonly go to space to those hotels or whatever they we will have those facilities in the future. Exactly, and and we'll get to we'll get to see what those those space hotels that we've we've imagined in our science fiction futures yep. finally come into being. All right, so we're we're putting we're putting spaceships up, we're putting people up. Um, now, something I know that is is close to your heart. Uh, we're also putting up. I, I mean, everybody's still thinking about JWST, but we're putting up more space telescopes. So, what space telescopes do we have coming up this year? So we have plenty of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. ISRO is launch launching two missions to uh, do heliophysics, uh, Aditya, and Exposat uh, to do X-ray astronomy. Mm -hmm. ZVOM will be a, a mission, a, a, a telescope to study gamma rays. Uh, it's a partnership between the Chinese Space Agency and the French Space Agency. And that will be launched as well in uh, mid-2023. But what I really want to talk about is the, uh, the, the space telescope called Xuntian. So it means heavenly cruiser. So Xuntian is the, the Chinese HST, I would say. And it's better than the, the HST because, of course, it's a new telescope. So it's a 2.4 meter class telescope, primary mm -hmm. mirror. So it's the same size and roughly than HST, but a wider field of view. So 300 times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope field of view. Um, I do, this telescope will be like HST equipped with various instruments, different type, UV camera, visible camera. I don't have the list of all of them, but it will be in orbit around Earth. 
and will be also able to attach to the Tiangong space station. So they will be able to do some modification of the telescopes over time, change the instrument, improve the sensitivity, etc., or make some repairs like we have done with the Hubble Space Telescopes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really going to be the, the first generation of large space telescope in China to do, to do astronomy. And um, I think it's important to, yeah, China is now capable of sending those, those space telescopes and doing super interesting science, hopefully, with these telescopes. We will see. Well, that's, that's one to look forward to. Uh, and is it going to work similar to how they, they did FAST, um, where they're going to be sharing that data out? Uh, no information about that. And that's uh, one of the problems I have with uh, Chinese space agency. It's very difficult to find information in English on the, on the web, unfortunately. Right. So I was, uh, I'm hoping that there will be some talks at the AAAS this year and to discuss this, to discuss access to the data, to discuss uh, programs, how they're going to make call for proposal, call for observations, for instance, because you will be it would be important it would be extremely important for china to to open this facility to non chinese uh, national for instance so we can do scientific investigation with this telescope as well um okay uh well here's hoping then so we're we're past a half an hour and i know we have one more topic everybody wants us to kind of touch on so um what is happening for SETI research um, this next year? Do we have anything exciting on the horizon? Well, for when I was thinking about that, of course, the first, uh, the new facility that will come online this year is COSMIC. Mm -hmm. So COSMIC is the kind of an alien hunter instrument at the VLA. People know the VLA. It's a very large array. It's basically the... Um, the array that you can see in the movie Contact, mm -hmm. okay, where Jodie Foster is there listening to the aliens, she's using the VLA to uh, to do this research. But and now headphones, have... which doesn't work like that. But anyway, yeah. go on. <laughs> <laughs> now we have uh, an instrument at uh, at the VLA called Cosmic, and this instrument is going to piggyback basically on other observations and listen to uh, signal coming from a search for signals as, uh, signals coming from uh, planetary pl planetary worlds nearby us like uh, 400 light years from us and they they calculated that in 2 years of operation they will be able to listen to 40 million uh, star systems so that will be the most comprehensive survey in the northern hemisphere for techno signatures okay so and, we, uh, this is ambitious and, and and important, I will say, in the world of SETI. And and we will have um, people from that for a SETI talks. Yeah. Uh, next on month. January twelfth. Uh, oh, this one. January eighteen. Yes. Right, January so, eighteen. So, so. We have uh, uh, Mark Huzindana and uh, Chenewa Trembre. They are going to talk about this project. So if you want to know more. Uh, join us for, for the SETI talk on January 18. We're making the announcement today. In fact. Yes, the announcement will go out today and you'll start to see that uh, in social media and we'll have links to our Eventbrite. Um, attendance, of course, is free. You can you can register for free and show up for free, but um, we only do the SETI talks via our, our Zoom seminars. So um, if you want to see it live, that's where you, can, you need to come. Um, and then on top of that, um, at the end of last year, uh, one of the, the last uh, the last study live I did was with uh, Dr. Anna Maria Berea, who is a member of the of NASA's new UAP committee that just began meeting in October and is expected to have their uh, report out, I believe, June or July. And um, so that's the other thing that we're kind of looking forward to is seeing what they decide, what they discover, what they um, learn from uh, figuring out how we can catalog uh, UAPs that are observed by um, our space telescopes, our ground telescopes, all of these sorts of things, and figure out how exactly to go about categorizing and, and understanding what these all are and what, what they could be. 
Um, that report will be out uh, later this year. And uh, we have a SETI talks event. We're just starting to plan with uh, not only uh, Anna Maria, but a couple other people from that committee yeah. who are uh, friends of the SETI institutes or uh, trustees of science people. It's, we'll have quite a few. So um, it's be an interesting talks because we are going to have different point of view of different people, not only astronomers, not only people who search for UAPs and study them, but journalists as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and um, I don't know what to expect from these reports. I've, I personally have no idea what they are, what they are going to, uh, to find or what, they, what they're going to propose as classification or something. I don't know. Maybe you have some inputs from the previous SETI Live you made on this topic? I, so I think the main thing is, is don't expect that they have access to anything classified or, uh, and they're not looking at, um, say, submissions. They're looking at uh, scientific data collected by a variety of instrumentation uh, using different telescopes and observatories um, and then seeing, you know, what similarities there are, what differences, how they might be able to catalog, coming up with a way to scientifically analyze some of these these UAPs that are in the data um, and figure out, you know, what what we can do to understand them and, and maybe, you know, who knows, maybe discover like a new uh, classification of of astronomical phenomenon that we hadn't mm -hmm. noticed before because we just didn't have enough data. Um, so it's, it's exciting to see where it will go. And it's, it, the committee is definitely a wide ranging group of people with different uh, scientific uh, interests and expertise. So I'm really looking forward to it. And that was a lot of words. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're really looking forward to that coming out. Um, I'm hoping it'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it'll give us answers because this is sort of like the first step. But yeah. I'm 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 hoping that we'll we'll at least have a, a comments on the chat. People need to remember that this committee was implemented last year, end of the mm -hmm. last year. So give people time before like jumping on conspiracies and stuff like that to be direct. Maybe it's time to kind of cool down a little bit and think about like a scientist mm -hmm. and let people study, analyze the data, because that's something we have been trying to do for years and years, and I think it's happening now, so we should all be happy about that and all be supportive of this committee first. And uh... and, and when we say classified data, we're just talking about observations that, that the US government has made or other governments have made that they don't necessarily want to release to scientists for whatever reason, but it's kind of unimportant in that we have a lot of telescopes around the planet and in orbit, and they're collecting data all the time that we don't necessarily understand everything from. So it, it is good that we're finally getting some traction on finding things in that data that we haven't seen before or don't understand and yeah. getting, you know, actually getting some funding from from agencies to, to actually analyze that stuff. So, <laughs> um, we have we have some questions, so I'm going to kind of go through a little. Um, first off, uh, Ron asked what was new with SETI, and I think we just answered that for you, Ron. So thank you for for asking the question. We we did get to it. We just saved it for last. Um, and then uh, let's see. That also covers uh, Bronwyn Davis. So thank you, Bronwyn, for also asking about SETI discoveries in 2023. Um, okay. Randy Soutier is asking, have we ever seen this comet before? And the answer is no. It's on a 50,000 year orbit. So um, no, we haven't seen this one before. That's pretty much the case with a lot of things, a lot of comets. Um, the Oort cloud is a big sphere, essentially, of uh, icy bodies out way far in our solar system that can get gravitationally perturbed by any number of things. And um, occasionally they get knocked in towards the sun and they sometimes have a very long orbit that actually comes back. And sometimes they have a very hyperbolic orbit that goes right through the solar system. And sometimes they get too close to the sun and we see nothing more of them, but a few tiny fragments later that are very disappointing when you're trying to go out and look at comets. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the reasons we study those comets, for instance, to answer specifically to this question, is that 
we can also, through the type of activity they have, determine if this comet has done this first passage in the inner part of the solar system or not. Uh, because when they are very primitive body, they're full of volatile elements. So we see a different type of activity. So we have some suspicion about how we can uh, understand the path of this comet by simply looking at this activity, but it's still not a done deal. So that's the reason we observe them regularly. And that's the reason it's important to catch them before they arrive, when they are close to the sun, then close to us, because then we can do spectroscopy, analysis of the color, composition of the gas, etc. And people are putting now together slowly a story of type of comets, where they're coming from, long period, short period, if they have been coming to us for the first time or not. And it is a work in progress. And and it just goes to show that just because uh, some of us just like to look at them as pretty objects, they are still scientifically interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just, I'm gonna go with this one because uh, one of our colleagues has started and I, I think it's kind of funny. So Doomsday Library is asking, are either of us an alien? And I'm gonna say not to my knowledge, Fra. At the SET Institute or? I, I think either of you or me. At the sample, ah, us, you, no, I'm not an alien. I'm, yeah. Uh, I've been like, yeah, validated as a human by uh, a lot of different tools, including, <laughs> uh, I don't want to promote some of them, but you know, genetic analysis. So I'm fully human, unfortunately. But thank you for the question. Yeah, th thank you for the question. Thank you for checking, you know, much appreciated. Um, unfortunately, no, I'm, I'm not an alien either. And uh, I think I'm okay with that, but um, I, I'm still, still hopeful we'll find some sort of life beyond Earth in my lifetime. Um, Lakes is asking, and this is, a, this is an opinion question. Uh, Lakes is asking uh, you specifically, what do you think about the ecological effects of space tourism? Oh, that would be an entire city life. Uh, two things. Um, when we started building um, train track across the US, we had to destroy forest and the environment. But then ultimately, this has been extremely useful for our civil technological civilization, right? Because now we can carry uh, uh, goods around across the, the land, and then we invented airplane, etc. So I will say that space tourism will probably have less ecological effects on Earth than we believe. Because sending, ro sending rockets is not only, send, uh, rockets don't, only, don't produce that much contamination in the atmosphere, for instance. But then we have to send all those materials up in space. So that means that we're gonna remove some material from our own planet to send it to space. Mm -hmm. So after a while, we're going to deprive our own planet from resources. So that's one of the reasons it's important we start thinking how we can make this sustainable on the long period of time. And I'm, talking, I'm not talking about five years here. I'm talking about 100, 200,000 years. And for that, we will need to be able to harvest basically the material around us in space. It's cheaper too, because it's easier to bring a piece of an asteroid to a space station than mm -hmm. to take a kilogram of iron from the ground of Earth and escape the gravitational well to go up, up to a space station. So at the beginning, I would say that we will probably affect the ecological system of our planet slowly uh, because of the rocket's launch and so on. But ultimately, we will have to make this more sustainable. I think that's, I think that's a reasonable answer. Um, and one last one before we, we call this a day. Um, it's a, it, this is a sort of a long one and I think we can kind of sum it up a bit, but Phil Sherwood is asking uh, what advancements we will have in understanding and analyzing the makeup of exoplanets. Um, oh. And there's there's more to that, but I, I think I think the, the simple answer is JWST. <laughs> I was about to say that, yes. <laughs> JWST has started observing exoplanets by transits and a few by direct imaging. Uh, those are te te technology, in fact, direct techniques that we've been using on the ground, but now we're gonna be using them in space. And of course, scientists always use the, always observe the easiest first, of course. So we have been observing large exoplanets, brown dwarf, Jupiter-sized exoplanet, 
or very bright transiting exoplanet, meaning that the star is bright because it's close to us and also it's an M-type star, so it's very red, which is great for JWST. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting now into the cycle two, and in cycle two, we're basically going to start doing more challenging things and more interesting in my mind. So one of them will be to directly image a lot more exoplanets, like 51 Eridani B that we discovered in 2015. It's probably going to be a next target for one of the targets for JWST cycle two. I hope someone will get time to do that. So we're going to analyze the atmosphere, understand the composition of planets which are like Jupiter, not too mm -hmm. close from the planet, the star, but far away. So I have a better understanding of those, the chemistry on these exoplanets. And then also, uh, when I was at the JWST science conference, first result, uh, there is some hits of indication of presence of atmosphere around some of the transiting exoplanets, but they quickly realized that they need to have more observations uh, to confirm that. So we, have going to, we are going to have additional observation taken of some TRAPPIST-1 planets and other transiting exoplanets. So we have detection of an atmosphere, if there is one and or more importantly, the composition of this atmosphere. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to see this, and it's going to probably happen in 2023, towards the end of 2023, we are going to have publication of those uh, exoplanets. And, and the, the, early, uh, the early release science program has already provided us with some very exciting new looks at, um, as, as you said, hot Jupiters, ones that are, are big and, and orbiting close, um, including a, an atmospheric analysis of WASP-39b, which um, I did, we did a study live on with um, four of the five graduate students slash postdocs who uh, did, were the lead authors on the papers analyzing this atmosphere. So um, if you want to see all about that one, we have that up. Franck did an interview uh, with the graduate student who was doing uh, TRAPPIST-1 or the TRAPPIST system, TRAPPIST-1 system analysis. So um, you can check out her short and, and the, the brief interview he did with her asking her some questions about that research and what has come from it. And we have, you did a ton of interviews at, at that JWST conference. So there are, there are lots of more videos coming from, from things that Franck has, has asked people tons of questions about their research uh, that week. So I'm really, really excited yeah. <laughs> to and see all of them. I'm going to be very honest with the people here. I, we learned a lot of fantastic results with JWST during this conference, but they were under embargo. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to break the embargo. I'm not going to scoop my colleagues, but you will see over the next six months, we are going to have some very cool uh, scientific papers on the study of Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. Like things that we didn't expect, you will see there is some very cool things coming from JWST, to, which also study Europa, uh, Ganymede and also Enceladus. So mm -hmm. we will have SETI live every time some results come out. And we, I will probably organize a SETI talk uh, in the next uh, three months, specifically on astrobiology with JWST. So that's, that's going to be exciting. So everybody kind of, uh, you know, subscribe, follow, like, share, do all of the things so that you can stay informed and you can you can have friends come join us as well because it's it's last year was big but i really think this year is is going to be just as big if not bigger especially once we really get rolling with some of this jwst data um and and there's so many more things to look forward to so um that's what we have coming up in 2023 um Again, next week, I'll be talking with Dr. Scott Bolton, the program manager for the for Mission Juno, to talk about their extended mission and Galilean moon observations. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll have our first study talks of the year, which is on cosmic, which we were talking about earlier. So um, piggybacking on the very large array to, to gather <laughs> petabytes of data. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and use all of what's already being collected. So. Um, Frank and I are, are really excited as to how this year is going to go. And uh, in an exciting announcement, and I'm hoping I'm not too premature on this, we're going to turn Study Live into a podcast. So if you are listening to this on our first podcast, congratulations. You, <laughs> you win. You, you got the first one. And for those of you who are watching this live today, thank you so much for joining us. 
we really do appreciate all that you have done and all of your support. So um, thank you for the bits, the subs, the the super chats and the stars that you guys have given uh, last year. And we uh, look forward to more of the same this year. So everybody have a fabulous rest of the week. And again, happy new year. And thank you, Frank, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.